think we are good to go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to the last and final uh, installment or episode of the Muslim Household. Now, the Muslim Household uh, series has been part of the initiative called uh, Ramadan with Kalima, where uh, for the past uh, four weeks, we've been having two sessions every week. And uh, in these uh, uh, sessions, Abu Musab has been, uh, you know, focusing around the topic, which is uh, a Muslim household. Now, we've covered uh, almost seven topics till date, which is uh, the first topic was the etiquettes with Allah, the etiquettes with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the etiquettes with uh, parents and children, the etiquettes between uh, the wife and husband, the etiquettes of permission and entrance, basically the etiquettes of gatherings, the etiquettes of greeting each other, uh, speaking and joking. And lastly, the last session was on the etiquettes of clothes, adornment and appearance. Now, uh, part of every session, right, there were many questions that we actually got uh, on the YouTube channel. Yeah. So we've uh, usually asked uh, the audience to actually leave the questions in a Google form or a form that we've actually shared. So Alhamdulillah, we've had a lot of questions come in and uh, today's session we thought we'd just mix it up a bit rather than Abu Musab going alone every week. Uh, we thought, you know, I'll also jump in and we'll make, try to make it more interactive today. So inshallah, let's get started with the Q&A. So, Assalamu alaikum Abu Musab. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Shiaf, my friend of all time and my colleague in the camps and my buddy, my ski buddy and my swimming buddy and I don't know what else. So good to see you, brother. Nice background, nice camera, nice setup, nice everything. I think we've, uh, I think we are uh, already past that. Alhamdulillah, even your background is quite good. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> so, um, so how was how's things? Uh, how's uh, how does it feel to be in the last uh, leg of Ramadan? Wallahi, it's a mixed feeling, yeah, Akhi. It's uh, we the, uh, each year, as we already know, it it it's faster and quicker than the previous. And I think this year is even faster than any, maybe because we didn't leave the house as often. Um, but again, we're also approaching Eid, so you you have that anticipation for Eid, the sadness over the departure of Ramadan. Uh, mixed feeling as as everything is right now. COVID nineteen is a life of a lifestyle of mixed feelings. So this is just another example of mixed feelings. Alhamdulillah, yeah, true, true. I think a uh, lot of people would agree to that. This Ramadan was unique. I think uh, once in a lifetime. Uh, I, I'm sure, you know, in, in most of our lives, we've never experienced this. So anyways, inshallah, let's jump in uh, straight to the questions. So we have around uh, 15 to 20 questions, if I'm not wrong. And uh, we have separated these questions as for the topics that I mentioned earlier. So uh, Abu Sab, shall we start with the first question? Go ahead, sir. Okay, Bismillah. So... The first question actually comes under the topic of uh, etiquettes with Allah. Okay. And this first question, uh, personally, uh, I think it's a very interesting one and something that is very, very uh, common among the youth these days. Okay. So, mashallah, we have a brother who is uh, 21 years old and uh, he says, mashallah, you know, he prays five times and he tries his best, you know, to keep up his prayers. Uh, but at times he usually gets this whisper, you know, specifically, you know, the, he, he kind of has a suspicion and uh, he gets these questions, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, about the, about Allah himself and mm. why, uh, you know, evil is there as well. Okay. Now this brother is actually asking, how can he overcome this? And, uh, as you know, this is something, uh, mashallah, okay, this is a 21 year old brother. There are in, in the camps that we've actually seen, even 15-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old boys, youth actually have this question. And I think this is usually the first step towards something more dangerous at times. So what do you think? What is, how do you think you can actually address this? Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad. I'm going to take this back to the source. And the source is that the Sahaba had witnessed something similar. In fact, the Sahaba said to the Prophet Sallallahu one of us will have such evil thought about Allah that we would rather be thrown from the sky 
rather than even utter it. Even the mere utterance or telling you what it is, is, is so inconceivable, so abhorrent that we cannot even say it. He said, والسلام, have you found that? Have you reached that point? He said, this is Iman. Then he told them to seek refuge with Allah in case thoughts of this nature come again. So there are two things I want to establish. Number one, do not look at this as a negative thing in the pure sense. All right. When, when the shaitan sees that a person is uh, increasing in Iman, they're trying to practice Islam more, they're trying to advance in their relationship with Allah, surely he's not going to sit there with his arms crossed and, and watch you do it. He's going to do whatever he can to divert you from that. And among those is those type of whispers about Allah's, Allah's nature, Allah himself, things of the sort that you, you get scared, actually. You get scared by merely thinking about them. What I'm going to say is, this is an indication that you have Iman. Because if you did not have Iman, then the shaitan wouldn't bother you to begin with. If a person wasn't making an effort to know who Allah is, then the shaitan would not be making an effort to try to distort your thought of Allah. And so understand that this is an indication of Iman. That's a good news. That's a good news because we want to be positive when we come across these situations and we want to build on a solid foundation. That said, you have to now run the show. The fact that the shaitan is whispering such ideas to you does not mean that you let him become the rider and you become the horse and then he's going to tell you go right, left, move, stop. On the contrary, you have to take control of that situation. And you do so by number one, learning the proper aqidah so you can reinforce the knowledge. Second of all, whenever these ideas come to you, do not entertain them. You seek refuge with Allah and you busy yourself with something else. Busy yourself with beneficial knowledge. Talk to someone about it. What you don't want to do is you don't want to allow the shaitan to have you uh, expand on a falsehood, on falsehood and a false idea where you try to get so creative in that sense until you create a confusion for yourself that you can do with that. I tell you, Wallahi, all of us, anyone who has gone through Iman, from my experience, has gone through this phase. And that phase is not permanent. It always happens for a duration of time. And then by Allah's grace and mercy, it's a test from Allah. Obviously, the shaitan doesn't act on his own. Allah allows it to happen. Allah is testing your patience, testing your perseverance, testing your forbearance, testing your, your sincerity. Hang in there. It will go away, inshallah. Do not entertain it and do not go uh, on fishy websites or go Google and try to find information from unreliable sources because a lot of information out there is actually meant to create bigger confusion than the one you have. This is when, when you have to refer to a knowledgeable person. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. Don't try to venture on your own and figure it out. If the matter is uh, uh, solid, valid, and complicated, refer to a person of knowledge. Inshallah, he will be able to simplify it for you, explain it for you in simple language, and then you will be able to overcome it. Bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. Inshallah. I hope uh, the brother who's asked the question is actually listening to this and he's got the answer. Uh, the next question, uh, Sheikh, it is, it's also another interesting one. Again, now this question comes from a parent. Yeah. And the question is, uh, apparently this parent has a very smart child who is around uh, six years old. And uh, this child apparently asks questions, embarrassing questions. And what this embarrassing question is, uh, who created Allah? Uh, who was before Allah? Is he male or female? Now, uh, I know before you get into the answer, Sheikh, you know, this, if you notice the line of questioning here, uh, this is something we see very common. Now, the parent feels embarrassed. And yes. The child is asking this question, which I feel uh, it's a very genuine question, right, yes, sir? Yes, of course it is. So, okay, what advice or how would you answer this? Like, what can you tell this parent? We have to speak to both, actually. We have to, before we speak to the child, because it's a child. Uh, this, subhanAllah, uh, these events are a sign and an indication that the parents need to be on top of their aqidah. Because if you struggle in answering uh, a question, I would say rather simple. Uh, it's a simple question, but what makes it complicated is that you have to explain it to a six-year-old. 
So you have to have the knowledge of uh, kind of decreasing the level of, of vocabulary, decreasing the level of complexity in your speech so that it is digestible to a child. I think that's the challenge. I hope that there's no challenge in answering the actual question if it were asked by an adult. But to your surprise and mine, a lot of parents actually don't know how to answer these questions. And if this is the case, then I begin by advising the parents. Yeah, uh, brothers and sisters in faith, when Allah Azza wa Jal gave you this responsibility of looking after your children and raising them, the most important thing that you need to convey to them is understanding their religion. Before you teach them manners, before you teach them etiquettes, before you teach them education, before you teach them whatever thing, which is all fine. We're not trying to undermine any, any good uh, etiquette or any good trait. But more importantly, you need to be able to teach them uh, these basic matters about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for you to do so, that requires that you learn yourself. Now, when you have a child, an inquisitive child, an intelligent child, this is a blessing from Allah. So don't look at it as an irritating thing. Say, yeah, I'm this child, yeah, akhi, with these questions. No, no, this is a blessing. That means that that child may have the potential to become, inshallah, a person of knowledge, a da'i, a scholar, someone who's able to yeah, take in information and communicate it to the people again. So look at that child as someone or a, a, a child that you need to invest into. Because if you're able to explain these things adequately, then you could say that he learned these matters from a young age and that is definitely in his favor and in your favor. Just simply, when you, when you, the question is, is very easy. If you know Surah Al-Ikhlas, then, then the case is closed. And I believe any believer should be aware of Surah Al-Ikhlas. The fundamental principle is that Allah Azza wa Jal lam yalid wa lam yulad. He did not beget nor was he begotten. So the definition of God is the creator who was not created. That's the definition. The, for someone to wonder who created God or who was there before God, it, it defeats the purpose or the definition of the doctor. So it's an invalid question because we've already established that Allah Azza wa Jal was there and there was nothing else and that Allah created everything. This is a matter of Iman. And fortunately, it's an already in the fitrah of the child. It's in, it's in the natural dispos disposition of the child. All you have to do is reinforce it and establish it in their mind. And then it is a natural for, natural for them to accept it. It's not something they will argue with you on because they can't insist that Allah has a creator. What, where are you getting the information from? Where will they get this kind of information from when you've already established that the definition of the creator is the one who is not created, rather is the one who creates. Khalas, if you had taught them the definition from the beginning, who Allah is, that question actually wouldn't have come, just so we can be clear. So that's why, regardless of the age of the child, from a very young age, start introducing these matters in simple language so that you already establish the proper foundation for this child. And please, for Allah's sake, take the time for you to learn these matters and then learn how to communicate them to your children, uh, give them quizzes on them, and give them big rewards. Have it. This is what, honestly, I'm not, I'm not well, I'm bragging, but because this is relevant. This is what I've been doing with my children. I make them watch a lecture on Aqidah, okay? And all of them are taking notes. They're taking notes, and then I give them a quiz at the end. Whoever gets the most correct answers, they're given a hefty, a hefty award. Something that otherwise they would not have gotten. And children, this is how they work. They love anything you give them. Candy, money, toy. It's an incentive for them. And now what am I gaining from this? I'm making them watch a whole hour lecture uh, on, on, I know, maybe advanced, but it's training their mind. Even the youngest one, it's training their mind to start understanding how we Muslims behave, how we Muslims believe, and so on and so forth. So you could do something like this. I know uh, many, many du'at have content that is tailored for children that you can use and capitalize on so you can introduce these basic concepts to the children, inshallah. So I think the, in a nutshell, uh, it goes back uh, to the parents starting to educate themselves first. Because if you remember, Abu Musab, uh, we've discussed this a couple of times in our camps. Yes, sir. Well. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, okay, this is a six-year-old kid. Now, this same six-year-old kid can become a 16-year-old or a 20-year-old adult. And because he did not get these questions answered, and, you know, they reach to a place where, you know, uh, things get really out of hand. And usually, 
most of the time instead of parents i think what we've seen uh, instead of parents educating themselves they try to outsource this or they try sending them to you know a five day camp like the camps we do yeah ask, in this five days khalas he's going to learn all of aqeedah he's going to learn everything and he's going to come back i think this is also something the parents should not be doing yeah it's a misconception i mean uh, the camp the camp is meant to uh, aid your 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 effort it's meant to aid your project it's not meant to be the project on its own uh, you have to have an establishment in the house to raise your children islamically and then whatever activities different organizations hold are meant to be supplements to that major project you cannot expect them to be you know guided in uh, within five days in an activity where they're mixing with so many people and then the rest of the year you kind of hoping that the next camp will come around for them to be uh, you know fixed once again uh, as parents we need to put a lot more effort than this and i mentioned this in the talk uh, about the rights of the children it is their right and we are shepherds and we will be asked by allah azza wa jal about our children so we need to take it seriously and uh, some a question the, the next question is actually connected to this i think it will be an extension of this answer is now this is from a parent who is actually asking specifically he has a teenager okay nah. has a teenager and this guy is completely uh, sliding towards atheism okay uh, this is now this guy is 16 or 17 years old and uh, he does not know uh, what has to be done now how does uh, and the the most standard questions okay like like the first question uh, the what this teenager asks is why if there is so much uh, good okay if 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 allah is all rahman rahim and all this stuff then why is there so much pain why is there so much death this is a normal you know atheist uh, 101 the starter pack questions usually so yeah. how can this and this parent this father is in his like say late 40s and the son is now 15 16 how do you think uh, what can be done now like what what can be a solution for this ya sheikh what can be what what needs to be the solution needs to be that there has to be a, a strong connection between the father and the child what we've seen akhi uh, shiaf i know you know this we've seen a major disconnect between the parents and the children it's almost like they're living in two different time zones or two different eras they live in the same house but there's absolutely nothing in common between them the father believes as long as he's going to work Uh, and uh, paying the bills and then he's done his job towards his, his family and then he could just watch tv for the rest of the night and life goes on uh, brothers in faith you know that the matter is a lot more serious than this these children of the children of your, your your kids if they don't find that emotional connection with you they're going to outsource it they're going to look for it outside and when they look for it outside you have no idea who's going to offer it to them and when someone offers them falsehood because of their emotional um disadvantage they will wind up accepting falsehood because at least someone is showing them care someone is giving them attention and they are attention seekers children and i have kids i know from my own kids kids want attention uh, to the highest point possible when you give them less attention they might overreact or they might act out so that you are focusing on them as opposed to whatever is distracting you in this world don't let the matter become so severe Don't wait till it's too late. Don't think that someone else would do the job on your behalf. You have to be involved. You have to know what your children are watching. You have to. You are like an auditor. You have to audit your kids. What are they watching? What books are they reading? What's taking place in the house? Because if you're not involved, then you will be surprised that they've been hiding something for you from you for years and then one day, you know, you you get the shock of your life that the matter is a lot more serious than what you thought. and and that's one thing another thing to address the issue we are, this is the uh, abc's of islam yani uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he did not create if he did not allow evil to exist there will be no point in having free will there will be no free will the whole idea of the free will is to the embodiment of the concept qul al-haqq min rabbikum fa man sha'a falyu'min wa man sha'a falyakfur say this is the truth from your lord whoever wills wishes to believe can believe Whoever wishes to disbelieve can disbelieve. Allah made the existence of evil and good uh, together so you can appreciate the appreciate them. If you would not know what good is if evil didn't exist and in everything that Allah decreed there's good. And I've said this many times even a child who dies in Africa from starvation at the age of 2 you could say ya akhi Allah yahdik what goodness is there in that? We say subhanallah alazim 
It's good for the child that he is going to Jannah, according to the opinion of Al Sunnah al Jamaah, the opinions of Al Sunnah al Jamaah, that he is not held accountable because he died as a, as a child, didn't reach the age of puberty. He's going to Jannah, he doesn't have to deal with the headache of this world. His parents are being tested in case they had diverted from the path. This is means for them to return to Allah Azza wa Jal. When the people establish the, the uh, rituals of, of uh, burial and the funeral and the gathering of the people together, the mentioning of God, the remembrance of God, all of these are acts of worship. Other people from outside, when they see children dying, they get involved with charitable acts uh, and charitable deeds. And then there's a movement that happens where humans come together towards serving other humans because they were negligent of them. All of this khair is a byproduct of this, what appears to be evil. And so this is how this world is meant to be. If it was all good, there will be no Jannah and Jahannam. We will not be here. There will be no dunya. There will be no test. Khalas, everybody will be qualified to go to paradise. If there was no failure in school, there will be no graduates who are entitled to be doctors and engineers. Everyone goes to school. Everyone graduates. Everyone becomes a doctor. It just doesn't fly. There has to be people that flunk the class for you to know who has been qualified to become a, a, a professional. It's just the way the world works and everything. Uh, people, qualified people get jobs. If a person is underqualified, he doesn't get the job. That's the, that's the essence of having good and evil in this world. And we don't attribute this evil to Allah. It's evil in our limited perception. But with Allah Azza wa Jal, it is for the ultimate good of mankind. And if they don't see it now, they will see it on the last day. But all of these can be communicated to the kid in a very straightforward way. We sit down with them. We show him the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. And wallahi, we have plenty. He needs someone to sit down with him with love. Someone to give him a hug and, and put his arm around him. Say, come here, man. Let me talk to you about this. Let us read this surah together. Let us read this tafsir together. Not, what are you doing? What are you thinking? A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah, shaitan. You're a shaitan in the house. Which is how some, some of us react as parents. When we panic, then we, we make the matter worse. You need to be reasonable. They shouldn't have reached that point to begin with. If they did, it's our fault. So let us not try to ruin it or fix it by becoming even worse, having a worse reaction. From the beginning, we should have taught them the proper things. If you teach them the proper things, inshallah ta'ala, they will remain on a straight path. Uh, you know, Musab, the funny, the, the interesting thing is, uh, as the session is going on, we already got the same question from a high schooler live. Oh, subhanallah. Again, same question. Why, why does God let bad things happen? So I was just checking that out. So I think this question generally is very, very relevant. The only difference is even adults have this sometimes, but they just keep quiet. They don't ask. But with the teenagers, they just go for it. And they usually use this chance. And one thing, a personal observation, which I'm sure Abu Musab can also relate, uh, having dealt with these kids, is uh, most of the time they use these things to get back at their parents. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and most of the time uh, in these situations, the problem is not just about them understanding of the religion. It is usually an emotional problem. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah, like exactly like Abu Musab, you just mentioned. So I think it, it's very important that first you build that father, son, father, daughter relationship first. Then even if your son, he becomes a teenager and he has questions like this, you can always approach him from that angle of love. Affection. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I want to add, since that question also came, if someone says, uh, then, you know, why does Allah uh, allow evil to exist? If, he, if Allah, if God exists, why does he allow evil to exist? We say, if God didn't exist, then how would you know that evil is evil? On what is the objective morality concept? How, do, how, how can you say that this is evil? According to who? The only reason why you're identifying something as being evil is because God made that as part of your instinct. To know that this is evil. Because if you claim that you don't believe in God, then therefore you don't have any basis for you to say this is right or this is wrong. So anyways, I have lectures on this. And if anyone has issues with this uh, with this matter, uh, please contact me uh, Contact me on my page uh, on YouTube, on, uh, uh, you know, One Way to Paradise on my Facebook. I can share with you links for lectures I delivered on this topic in particular. And I went into great detail. Uh, to, uh, you know, the, all the misconceptions about Islam and how to refute atheism. Uh, all these, alhamdulillah, have been done. Lectures are available. They're a little lengthy, but inshallah, you'll find them useful. If you need anything, just contact me. I'll share the links with you, bi-idhnillah. Jazakumullah khair. I think, uh, Sheikh, we will move to the, the etiquettes, etiquettes with Allah we've covered. We have one question again from uh, a parent. 
Now this is under the etiquettes with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The question is, uh, what is the best children's book below ten, and a book for plus ten on the Prophet's biography that uh, you know I can read with my kids, or the kids can read by themselves, or she, she or he can actually read with their kids before bed. Uh, طيب, there is a look. Generally, the 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 bookstore that I recommend or I trust the most, and I'm not saying they're perfect. Perfection belongs to Allah, but the the most one of the most reliable bookstores or publishers in this regard is Darus Salam. And I know Darus Salam has a book titled "When the Moon Split," and and this is a book that uh, actually I can show you right here. This is the book. When the moon split, this is an ideal book that speaks about the biography of the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi in the English language. Uh, when you go a little more advanced, you can obviously read to them the sealed nectar. Darul Salam generally has a lot of little booklets on the subject. You just have to visit the bookstore, whether online or in a physical place. They have an online sales, and and you can find a number of selection. I'm not aware of all of them, uh, but that's one example that I can give you. Uh, now. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next section, and this section again is going to be the most heaviest with the most questions. This is basically the etiquettes with the parents and children. Yeah. So the first question. Now this was a question that was, uh, I think it was a difficult question, in the sense uh, not the answer is going to be difficult, but uh, reading this question was uh, you know quite uh, uh, surprising. Now this is a teenager again uh, is asking. And this is specifically a sister who's a teenager asking that uh, the household she is from. Okay, uh, there is so much uh, pressure or there is so much tension. Okay, disagreements between the mom and uh, the dad. Mm. Okay, which results in a lot of bad conduct between these two people, between the mom and the dad. Okay, okay? okay. and uh, which again results in the mother and the father always complaining. Okay, and again because of this, they live under the same roof, but you know they are living completely different life. Like basically, the father has a different life, the mom has their own life. Uh, this, uh, the siblings have a different kind of life. Now the question the sister is asking, which is quite uh, shocking, and you know it's quite sad. Uh, she's asking like, what can she do? What sh what should she do? Being a sister who is still a teenager. Uh, of or not of age, if I'm not sure, uh, what? How can she deal with this? You know, what? Ca what can she actually do? She has to be the doctor. Uh, the fact that she's asking the question suggests that she has enough maturity. She's mature enough to be able to do something. I don't believe she's helpless. And inshallah, no one should feel that they're helpless because being helpless is as against the command of Allah Azza wa Jalla. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. لا تيأسوا من روح الله. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Again, multiple ayat speaking about having resolve, having determination, and being strong, being a strong believer. So first of all, this to the young sister, don't surrender, don't give up, and don't let the situation overtake you or overwhelm you. Rather, try to be the doctor. In the household, try to speak to your father in a kind and gentle way, just like Ibrahim spoke to his father. Try to advise him in private, not in front of everybody. Don't put him on the spot. Men's ego is a very delicate thing. You try to advise the man in front of his children or wife, it's not going to turn out good for the most part. Uh, for the most part, take him on the side, give him some words of love. Uh, children need to learn how to write letters. If sometimes confronting the parent is too much for you because you know that the the nature of that parent is that they they don't like anyone younger than them to be tell to tell them what to do or to be told what to do, then you can use other means of communication. You can go you know buy a gift and people always sleep on these means that are so useful and so effective. You buy a small gift, a bar of chocolate, a, a, a flower, a rose, anything, any small gift with a letter. That shows how much you love him and how much you care for him and how much you're concerned about him and his well-being and his relationship with Allah and the Akhirah. Those things can go a long way. They can go a long way and they speak volumes about how much you care about really resolving the situation as opposed to just whining and complaining about it all the time, which is what most of us do. Make some effort and the same goes to your mother. Try to reconcile between them. 
make a genuine effort to reconcile between them. If you're able to involve family members without creating a bigger fitna, be careful because sometimes when you bring the uncle in, you have a greater disaster than the existing one because they don't want any interference from outsiders. You have to evaluate the situation. If you can bring in someone that you know is influ uh, has an influence on them, then go ahead and do so. The bottom line is you need to make an effort to keep them in check and to keep them on, on the right track. That said, and you be patient. Beg Allah profusely and ask Allah's aid and assistance because that is a test from Allah Azza wa to you. And then ultimately, as soon as you're able to, when you, when you see that the situation is very bad and that remaining there is going to have a bad effect on you and you've reached the age where you can get married, then ultimately getting married is the way to go because getting married will get you out of this environment into a healthier environment. But don't do so to escape and abandon them. And don't do so without having made an effort to uh, reconcile between them and to advise them. Again, there are many stories of children that were wiser than their parents. They were able to rectify the affairs of their parents. They were able to fix them after they were broken. They were able to, they actually acted as the parent in the relationship where the parents became the children, the children became the parents. Don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Seek advice from people of knowledge. Seek advice from wise older people who can help you make a genuine effort. And Allah Azza wa Jal promised, Those who make an effort in our cause, we will guide them to the path. Allah promised that He will help and assist and facilitate. Put your trust in Allah. Assume the best about Allah. And inshallah ta'ala, you will achieve what you want. Inshallah. Uh, may Allah make uh, things easy for the sister, inshallah. Amir, ya Rabbi. And uh, also, this sister also says she's also currently to you know uh, to add to all this, she's also currently dealing with a chronic health uh, situation as well. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. May Allah Subhanallah. Uh, now the next question, uh, Sheikh, we'll uh, move on. Is see, this is again a teenager. Now we don't know if he's a boy or a girl, but he's a teenager. First of all, he says he really loves you and follows all your programs. Inshallah. And uh, so. I don't know how to make the heart. Okay. <laughs> and that's what the. Okay, anyways, influencers do today. But, anyways, moving on. So, uh, this brother or sister, the question is asking is again uh, quite painful. What this question, uh, the question is basically uh, my father, he, he or she is saying that uh, his or her father treats me very uh, cruelly. Like, you know, he's saying that my father treats me very cruelly. Uh, as if I'm the cause of all the world's problems. And sometimes that I feel that he hates me so much that I don't even, uh, I can't even imagine. Okay. And basically he says that uh, his father, uh, specifically his father, yeah, takes uh, advantage of every family gathering. Like any chance you actually get, khalas, just, you know, start uh, complaining about this guy, making fun of this guy. Yeah. And he's like, there are some, some of the things that he actually says, you know, okay, some of the things he has done, okay, he's admitting, but there are things sometimes he does not even do. But the ideal problem or the issue this young guy is actually having is his father openly just, you know, blaming him and, you know, making fun of him. Well, how do you advise uh, the father and what do you have to say to the young uh, teenager here? Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked us here because we have to begin with the father here. Um, look, the, the, Allah Azza wa Jal commands justice. You are supposed to be just even if it's against yourself. Um, look, I understand. Uh, let me just say, I, as a father, I can relate uh, in a sense that because we have such high uh, expectation from our children, uh, the highest that anyone can have, when they fall short, we do feel that they're, you know, because they're not doing what we ideally want them to do, then it becomes a great failure and that is injustice on our part all right because we've already set the, the the expectations so high and we want them to meet them all the time but guess what i'm pretty sure that when we were their age we were meeting maybe none of those expectations so let's just be let's just be realistic for the father malish understand that the child and this is another problem that we parents have we think that they have the same mental capacity that we have. But if they did, then they wouldn't be children. Uh, you're, you know, when you're 40 years old, 
it's not just about your level of intellect. It's actually your intellect and your wisdom and experience throughout the years. Whereas the child has the intellect, but they don't have the wisdom and they sure don't have the experience. So you want them to think, uh, you know, I, I see things eye to eye with you, but he doesn't have the same experience in life to ever be able to see things eye to eye. And so therefore you have to be realistic in what you expect from your child. And therefore, when you have a lower expectation, then he meets it, then you, you become proud about his achievement versus being disappointed all the time. Secondly, what, what good is that going to do to the child? If you call him out in every family gathering, you mention all the, uh, the bad traits. Yani, what kind of, uh, it's an embarrassing, you're embarrassing yourself, yaki. Because when you say that your child is such a failure in a family gathering, then you're technically saying that you are the father has failed. And raising your child properly. Ultimately, the child is a byproduct of your efforts. So it's not only it's a, it's an insult to the child, it's actually an insult to yourself. And maybe maybe nobody in the family is going to dare to say in your face, well, that means that you're a terrible father. But guess what? They're probably thinking exactly that. And so, ya akhi, wallahi, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does not make sense that you put your son in this predicament. Plus, think about the psychological ramifications of such statements. How much they will affect that child in the future, whether he will live his whole life thinking that he was a complete failure. And this is injustice. And Allah Azza wa Jal warned us from the hadith of Prophet ﷺ, uh, oppression will be darknesses on the day of judgment. Do you really want to have to deal with darkness on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because of an oppression, not even towards a stranger, rather towards your own son? That said, to the child, look man, understand that fathers are not mothers. Okay, that's the first thing. A father will rarely, some are exceptions, will rarely be as compassionate, as loving, or even be able to express his love like the mother. A father may love his children more than the mother love her children. But a father is hardly able to express that love the same way the mother is able to express that love. So my friend, the young teenager, understand that this does not translate to the fact that your father uh, hates you. Rather, I would assume that he is treating you this way because he wants you to be tough. He wants you to be strong. He wants you to be better. This is how he knows. The way he, this is how he knows how to deal with it. He doesn't have the emotional capacity to sit there and tell you sweet words and try to pat you on the back. The way he's been raised in his culture is probably one where he has to be a little aggressive. So please assume the best about your father. Assume that he's doing so, so that you can become a better person. Uh, he's putting, he's calling you out in front of the family member so that you can avoid ma making these mistakes in order for you not to be called out in front of your family member so you can become more careful about the mistakes that you make. Give it, look at it from the positive perspective, even though we know that there's negativity in there for your own well-being. Look at it from a positive angle and use it as means for you to improve yourself. Instead of whining and fighting and arguing with him, say, okay, what is it that he expects from me? Let me make an extra effort to become as the closest I can to what he expects from me. And then you will, you will eventually appreciate this, inshallah, when he's long gone and you grow. If a father is, is a, a little uh, serious and stern with you, for the most part, it winds up raising men. Because we see on the flip side, fathers that are too soft with their children, then the children also grow up to be extremely soft in the society. They don't in the cult, They don't know how to manage themselves. They don't know how to defend themselves. They don't know how to, you know, maneuver through this tough world we're living in. So there has to be a balance. Just assume that your father wants you to be strong. And so appreciate him for that instead of hating him in return. And uh, Abu Musab, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted you to uh, answer, but I also wanted to add, maybe it's possible, you know, these kids, the kids these days, some, there is a very high chance or there might be a chance that this kid might have slightly exaggerated. Like when he said that, you know, his father blames him for all the problems in the world. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that's an expression. Oh, COVID-19. What did you do, Abdullah? Didn't I tell you, Baba, what the heck did I do? Oh, well, I've been sleeping the whole time, man. Yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyways, I think uh, it was beautifully uh, answered. Uh, now, uh, let's quickly uh, move on. We have uh, like uh, two more questions. Uh, in about the etiquettes of parents and children. Now, the next question is, again, uh, it is a young guy, I can see, uh, most probably a teenager or maybe younger. Ustad, if my mother forces me to eat food on the table and 
if I am full, uh, is saying no uh, to it counted as bad manners and a sin? What if you don't like that food, but your parents force you to eat it? Mashallah, it's a nice question. And that's a nice question. And that that question is is me. I was that. I was that. Per I'm still that person at 40 years old. My mother, may Allah bless her and give her a long life and obedience. She, she still thinks I'm malnutrition or <laughs> under because I try to stick to a healthy diet. So she wants me to eat <laughs> meat and things that I don't exactly want to eat. Look, man, cut through the chase and make your mother happy or learn how to negotiate respectfully. So uh, that, 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 that's an incentive for you to learn. I uh, personally make an effort to, to please my mom and also get myself out of trouble. Uh, in a joking way with some humor with some you know funky stuff wherein i am neither forced to eat a lot of food that i don't want to eat at the same time i am not saying no to my mother uh, there are many tricks for that i'm not gonna you know i think time uh, we need to focus on other things but fundamentally speaking if the mother tells you to eat something uh, then go ahead and eat it uh, most mothers are reasonable they're not going to make you eat to the point where you vomit i'm sure she has a reason behind that and then after you and the, 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 just give me gonna give you a tip the tip is, and I give this to my children all the time, and subhanAllah, children have a hard time understanding this, this key to success. But I'm giving it to you, it's the key to success. First, conform, comply, and then discuss. When you're told something, don't begin by rejecting. The first thing, oh, no, 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 no. Say, okay, do it. After doing it, now your parents are happy that you're obedient. Then you can come and say, mom, now, may I talk to you about this? Wallahi, I ate this food for you. But wallahi, ya mama, I don't like it. Yeah, I need, I'm seconds away from vomiting. I ask you for Allah's sake, uh, is it okay that in the future you don't make me eat it? I would say 99.99% .99 of mothers will say, yes, I'm sorry, no problem. Very unlikely that she say, no, 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 you will eat it every day. Yeah, I need, these mothers, as far as I know, don't exist. If she exists, then I will talk to her. Okay, send me, have your mom contact me on my channel, then I will have a conversation with them. Most mothers will be like, no problem. The problem is that the children automatically refuse. So then it becomes a, a stubborn game. Because the parents don't want to be disobeyed. No, eat it. No, I don't want to eat it. No, eat it. No, I don't want to eat it. Eat it. I don't want to eat it. Yeah, okay, now you have a big fitna and big fight when you could have easily made your mother happy. You understand? Always, always comply first and then respectfully negotiate what happened earlier. Most parents will change their ways if you deal with them in this manner. Try it and give me the results, inshallah. Share the results with me. And uh, the next question is from a parent. Very, very relevant question. I think all the parents listening will relate to this. The mother or father, I think mo this sounds more or less like a mother. Okay. And uh, she's asking, I'm assuming by the way, I don't know. But so how do I raise my son? as a role model, especially with the large number of social media influencers slash vloggers slash content creators slash game streamers slash this goes on. I was yes. talking about this earlier, right? So this is that question, like how uh, the, this particular parent, the challenge is with all these uh, influencers these days, and they are actually called social media influencers because they influence and they start young. Yes. Yeah. So what do you have to say? What well, the, the first thing I have to say is that let's disconnect them from these influencers. Because when you, when you leave your child in the hands of a random anonymous person who has an agenda and that agenda is dinero is dollars is money what do you think these people are doing on youtube any streamer any youtube content creator at the end of the day this is a means of revenue for them uh, you know unlikely very unlikely that they're doing this fee sabirullah unless they're given da'wah and they're you know upon islam if it's some other topic then generally they want to make generate money and if they want to make money they usually don't have any decency or guidelines they are willing to compromise a lot of the matters of the deen in order to gain money in return. And so if you leave your child and you know, with those types of people, then what do you expect? They are definitely going to 
influence them because it's a brainwashing technique. And the brainwashing technique, I'll just tell you a little story that has been psychologically proven to be correct. A person went to work and upon entering work, his colleague saw him. He said, man, you look sick. He's like, no, no, I'm, I'm not sick, man. I'm, I'm fine. He sat down. A few minutes later, another colleague of him came and said, man, dude, you look sick. You look really sick. And then he's like, uh, yeah, man, I, 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 think, I think I'm a little sick, man. SubhanAllah, I'm a little sick. Then a few minutes later, a third colleague came. I said, man, dude, you look like you say. He said, man, I'm, I'm sick. I need to go home. And the guy, you know, sought excuse from his boss and went home. The bottom line is if you constantly tell people information, they will start believing it even though it is false, even though it is fictional. That's just the reality. So those influencers, they are trying to make money. They may use Islam, as we've seen many of them, they may use Islam to promote. They want to read. Okay, they say our target audience is Muslims, uh, you know, not Christians, Jews. They will make content relevant to each audience to bring them all in. Because at the end of the day, that's how they make money. They're not really trying to promote Islam. It is very unlikely that they're trying to promote Islam. So how do you raise your child as a role model? By first making sure you know who he's, whom he is following. Otherwise, it's like having a maid raise your child and then you expect that maid to do exactly what you would have done as a mother. It's never going to be the same. The mother, if you bring a, a Christian maid, let's say you're a Muslim woman, you bring a Christian maid and you want that Christian maid to ra raise your child and then when he's 15, you expect him to know everything that he would have known had you raised him yourself. Ya Shaykha, it's never going to happen because it's impossible. So you have to get involved. The child... I'm not saying that the children should be digitally backwards or they should be, uh, you know, uh, uh, behind uh, the rest of the world. They shouldn't know. On the contrary, we try to teach our children everything, every trick in the book so that they can be ahead of the rest of the world. They have their Islamic identity. They have their Islamic uh, uh, ID and, and uh, honor that they, they find a dignity in. At the same time, they are, they are competing with the others in terms of being leaders. In terms of them being the ones who are influencing humans in a positive way and not the other way around. Not the other one. That requires, my dear parent, your close involvement. You cannot be an observer, a spectator with your binoculars looking at your children from around 50 kilometers and, and hoping that they're doing fine. You need to be involved in the process on a daily basis. So what do we do in my house? The, right to my left is my is the laptop that my son uses and across from me is my wife and i'm sitting over here everything is with this within the same area so anytime i look at my son i know what he's doing i know what he's looking at i know what he's watching i'm you know whether me or his mother we're constantly involved in what he is being exposed to because we want him to learn how to create content how to be advanced at the same time i don't want him to be misled by some uh, you know funny joe out there so you need to be involved if you're involved inshallah you'll get what you want and uh, Musab, I also just wanted to add one more thing uh, that uh, five years and dealing with, you know, all of us dealing with so many kids. One of the main reasons uh, this happens also is the parents, again, connecting to the first question, where parents don't know about technology themselves. They don't know what, what is happening in YouTube. And there was a time and still there is a time where parents will actually come. These are usually parents who are slightly older, you know, above 40, above 45, late 50s. And they have kids who are like 13, 14, 15. There is a massive gap. Okay, you call it a generation gap. I don't know, whatever you call it, but there is a gap. And what they will say is, what does your son do? He's always on the computer. That's what they actually say. And some of them are actually proud. Oh, he's not like me. He's always yeah. on the computer. And, and like you rightly said, majority of these uh, vloggers, they start with the target audience who are like 12, 13, 14. Yeah. And I don't want to take names, but... Believe me, Wallahi ya Sheikh, every year the camps that we actually do, some of these guys who started four years back, today these guys are worse, like the kind of stuff they are doing online. So definitely, definitely parents, eh, either go check out YouTube, check out the parental controls that are there, uh, educate yeah. yourself a bit, definitely don't let them consume any lifestyle bloggers content. Every lifestyle blogger, like uh, Abu Musab said, there is economics behind it. They have yeah. to make money. Okay. Exactly. And eventually they're going to run out of content. 
And when they run out of content, that is when all the uh, funny stuff they actually start bringing in. And your 13-year-old son or 12-year-old son is exposed to the kind of stuff where me and Abu Musab might have been in, uh, exposed at the age of 20 or 21 or 25. Sahih. So uh, please, you know, parents be very, very careful on the kind of follows or just don't let them have YouTube at a very young age. Moving on, yeah, Sheikh. Uh, I think uh, we've, we've done with the major chunk. Now we'll quickly jump into the etiquettes between the wife and the husband. Yes. Now the question here, what we have is, uh, now somebody is asking, I'm married with three children and we have been married for seven years. And I'm very tired of the differences that occur between us in every small and big issue. Is there a solution to this matter? Yes, Jannah. But we're all in it. We're, <laughs> we're all in it together. You, do you think that they look don't any any the, the biggest sheikh in the world and the biggest allama and the biggest scholar and the biggest da'i and the average Abdullah and any brother everybody no family is like living in Jannah in this dunya where everybody's like oh there's this loves and hugs a bit we definitely have our own issues on uh, around the clock and you you just have to you know it's it's tiring but that's the, the dunya is meant to be tiring that's why Allah said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have created mankind in turmoil. You are meant to struggle. يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانُ إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهُ Oh human being, you will strive and struggle towards your Lord until you meet Him. It's never been claimed that you're going to go on a picnic. However, that said, Allah Azza wa Jal will aid the patients, uh, patient people. Allah will reward the patient people. Uh, that's why you need a relationship with Allah. Because of, because of all these struggles that we all go through, this will make you always in need of Allah. That will keep you in a state of servitude to Allah. If everything was perfect, you wouldn't need to beg Allah. And that's another concern. That some people who live this life, they're so rich, they're so well off, Nobody cares about nobody. They have peace in the family. But at the same time, there's also no religion. And there's also no, no preparation for the life to come. So it could be that Allah has given them the dunya because they're not going to have much in the akhirah. So look at the positive side. The positive side, if you're having issues, that means you're making an effort towards rectification, towards reconciliation, towards building an Islamic family. That's not going to go to waste. It's going to keep you connected with Allah. When you have everything at your disposal, then the human beings, as Allah said in the Quran, يستغني, then the person feels that he doesn't need, he doesn't need Allah anymore, he doesn't need to beg him, he doesn't need to worship him, he doesn't need to pray. So subhanAllah, it's a blessing from Allah, it's a blessing in disguise. Uh, Abu Sab, just to add to that question again, but here this person specifically says, I'm very tired. Okay, now what if somebody is like feeling they have reached their, what is the solution? I mean, we're all tired. Uh, how tired can you be? Go sleep. Uh, I know you mean something else, but yeah, if you know how tired you're gonna. There's no solution. I'm gonna say what? Yani you, we put you to sleep permanently because you're tired. You're everybody goes to sleep, gets up the next day. If all this is taken its toll on you from a health and a medical point of view, uh, then uh, then you you seek treatment. And if that turns out to be the reason why somebody leaves this dunya, then, they, you know, that's the decree of Allah. There, there is no magical solution where I'm going to send you a message and then all the problems at home have to be resolved. Obviously, obviously, we need to minimize the confrontation. We need to minimize the issues. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to keep it real with you in the sense that we are all facing the same thing. I'm not saying that we should be happy and clap about it and say, oh, it's all good. No, of course, we should uh, minimize all of these issues, but those issues are inevitable. The more you learn Islam, the more you practice Islam, the more you apply what advice was given to the parents, and the more the children apply the advice given to them, the less friction you're going to have. If the children were more obedient, life would be good. If the parents were more concerned about their children, life will be good. Honestly, it's a byproduct of our negligence for the most part. The more negligent we are about the rules of Allah, the more the shayateen are running around in the house, the more evil we're going to have. That's just the way it works. Inshallah. Uh, okay, Sheikh, now we'll move on quickly to the etiquettes of permission and entrance. This is one of the topics that we covered. Now, we have a question here. I think is another question which most of the parents can benefit. 
surprisingly, most of the questions, all the topics, it comes back to the parents or the children again. Yeah, of so course. Well, yeah, okay. So the question is, what steps do I use to teach my toddler the etiquettes of uh, the permission etiquette? I mean, uh, a toddler is a toddler. You, you cannot expect uh, so much from him. Uh, but uh, once, he, once he has the ability to comprehend information, uh, just like you teach them how to use the bathroom, most children, toddlers, at some point learn that when they need the bathroom, they come and inform you that they need the bathroom because they're transitioning from using diapers to using toilets. Uh, it's, I don't know of any particular way. It's just the same means of teaching them that you need to knock on the door. And you, when, you hear, uh, when you hear me say, come in, then you come in. Most children will be able to uh, comply with that. If the child makes a mistake, then you need to, you know, lock the door and use other means to, if the children just don't listen or the child is too, too young to listen, then you have to protect yourself in your own way. Uh, okay, Sheikh, next uh, we are going to the etiquettes of gatherings. Uh, there are two questions. I think uh, I will actually add, uh, connect the two questions. So basically, uh, Sheikh, always when I meet with my friends, they always backbite people. And when I advise them, they do not listen to me. What should I do? Okay. And uh, same, same. I think the second question, I think, is from the same person or because there's a connection. But anyways, uh, Sheikh, you go uh, ahead and answer this first question. Like, what can this person do where his friends are always backbiting? And, you know, and they don't listen to him. All right. Well, first, I will talk to the, the brother himself. If, if you had been, uh, you know, if you had been misguided, then Allah guided you. And so you became different than your friends. Or if you had always been practicing and you've always had these bad friends, regardless of the situation, you have to learn uh, how to advise. You have to learn the wisdom in giving nasiha, uh, the wisdom in enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Sometimes it just doesn't work that every time someone does this, you just become like the, uh, you know, on the spot, just uh, with, without, uh, without any uh, preparation, without any wisdom, without any evaluation of the situation. Allah told you sit there and tell them haram and you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Because what will happen for the most part is they will shun you and say, you know what, man, just leave us alone. So uh, for the most part, you need to advise those people on individual basis. If you're not the type where you're given a certain authority, if they take you as a person of knowledge and they allow you to give them a little talk where you prepare something at home, a couple of hadith with a couple of ayat about the, the prohibition of bike biting, and they allow you to, to speak, alhamdulillah. If they don't, then you want to grab them on a private one-on-one. -on -one. You sit down with the guy, say, listen, man, you know, I, you know, you're my friend, you're my homeboy, I like you so much. Bro, look, man, backbiting a Muslim is a very serious thing. And Allah says in the Quran, such and such, Prophet ﷺ says such and such. You try to rectify those people individually because, again, most people have a hard time accepting advice when giving um, in a public sphere. They, they, it doesn't sit well with most people. A, a few people are humble enough to say Zakallah khair and thank you so much, but most people will just rebel. So try to advise them in private, try to work with them. If you see that they're not going to change their ways you're, and you cannot continue to hear the backbiting, then you simply respectfully just leave. And that would be a lesson for them. When you just leave and abandon, then they will understand that you are pretty serious about this. Hopefully, those who have goodness in their heart will come around, inshallah, and they will abandon this evil trait. And the next question is, uh, again, uh, I am assuming this is a teenager. I have made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I want to change myself. I have friends who I meet to laugh and play, but who are bad. So how should I advise them and change? Well, let's begin with yourself. Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, ya quu anfusakum wa ahlikun nara. All you have believed, protect yourselves and your family from the fire. Begin with yourself. Work on yourself. Build yourself. What is important is that you are on the straight path. Once you are on a straight path and you're fortified with information and you're confident, then you can try to bring in from your friends whomever Allah Azza wa Jal has opened their heart for the da'wah and for the nasiha. Uh, that's just the, the basic rule. Uh, sometimes friends have to be replaced in all honesty. Sometimes certain friends are a poison in your life and no matter how much you love them and care for them and you try to bring them on board, they don't want to come on board, then you're better off without them. Uh, I have a lecture on the topic titled The Seller of Musk. 
uh, I suggest that you listen to it so you can understand how to go about selecting the good people and how to go about advising the bad friends so that you're all in, in, in uh, safety and you all attain your salvation, inshallah. Anyways, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to support you and to make it easy for you. Keep going strong. We've all made mistakes, Habibi. We've all made mistakes. Look, this brother who's right now answering your question, at some point I was a, I was a Buddhist and I was a rapper and I was an evil person. I'm just mentioning this so you will not think that, you know, I was born a, a sheikh. I've never been a sheikh and I'm not a sheikh right now. I, I'm just someone who gives da'wah. But I've had my past. I believe everyone has had his past. That past should be used as means for you to become better in the future, not as something to depress you and make you feel, you know, that, oh, I'm so bad. No. Allah forgives all the sins. Don't despair from Allah's mercy. No matter what you've done, if you start fresh, Allah will delete, will permanently delete all of your past sins and you will start off from, from scratch. That's how Allah Azza wa Jal deals with his creation. That's what he promised us. So that's something you should look forward to, inshallah. And Abu Musab, I just wanted to add one more thing uh, over here. Sometimes, uh, you know, these, uh, especially with teenagers or uh, young uh, people, when they start changing, they try too hard, you know, change their close friends. And like yeah. you said, they don't understand this fact of sometimes some friends need to be replaced. What end, end of the day, what happens is these guys themselves go back to their old ways. Sahih. Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. And uh, also the uh, earlier question, some of these guys are also there, you know, where they, mashallah, you know, they start practicing young guys. And all they do is, uh, instead of, you know, using wisdom, they immediately go meet their friends and all they do is khalas. They start, you know, throwing, okay, you are wrong. This is haram. That is haram. I think it gives an even worse uh, response than what was intended to begin with. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. How are we doing okay. in terms of time, Yashif? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure, uh, Sheikh, we can actually take uh, the online questions, but we still have three, four questions, which people have already have filled. Three more, three more questions. And inshallah, I think we can, uh, we'll have to apologize to the people because uh, I, I just took one question from the live. But no problem. Uh, these are questions which people have been filling in since three to four, three to four weeks. Okay. So quickly moving. Uh, the next is the etiquette of greeting each other, speaking and joking. I think one of these brothers is, or sister is actually referring to one of your speeches, uh, one of the sessions. If you are not allowed to answer the salam, then why do we do salam each and every day to all Muslims, brothers and sisters? I don't know uh, what this person is actually referring to. Oh, well, I'll answer it by saying you are allowed to, you're, you're obliged to return the salam. So just return the salam. Maalikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Next. Okay, and another question I think already answered was, uh, I just mentioned it here is, I'm, I'm being bullied by everyone. Okay. Sometimes even from my family. What should I do? You should hang in there. Uh, you should hang in there. And uh, it's been proven uh, that the people who were bullied the most or a lot when they were young turn out to be leaders in their communities at an older age. And so Allah Azza wa Jal sometimes prepares uh, a person uh, through tough environment, tough means, so they can become stronger and therefore become uh, better than the rest of the people at an older age. So everything is a blessing in disguise, including that, including that. So take it, take it uh, uh, positively. Uh, doesn't mean that you don't defend yourself, but just look at it as perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal is preparing you for a strong future where the bullying that you had to undergo, including from your family, would be means for you to prove yourself to be a better person when you grow older, inshallah. And then when you are in that position, make sure that you don't bully others like you were bullied. Uh, next question is a very common and uh, co not common and quite uh, asked a lot. Uh, this is from the advocates of uh, downwind and appearance. Is it haram to fully shave your beard, to go clean shave? Yes, it is haram to fully shave your beard. Um, as far as I know, that is the opinion of the four madhahib, uh, the four schools of thought. If you uh, want to find uh, a claim that you follow any particular one, I have a lecture on the title. On the I have a lecture on the topic titled "Let It Grow with the Natural Flow," and there I address everything about the beard and why you should keep it. Inshallah. So I just refer to the lecture. And again, from your last session, there's another question about, is it allowed for a woman to wear perfume that does not have strong fragrance and does not spread and cannot be 
smelled except from very close. Yeah, I, I can't tell because how 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 do you know that it meets all this criteria? The uh, yeah, it's a tough one because also the people's sense uh, smelling sense varies. Uh, some people, mashallah, they can smell. I could smell a, a cigarette from like two kilometers away, and the people around me are like, "What are you talking about? No one's smoking." I say, "Ya akhi, wallah, I could smell someone smoking," and then like five minutes later, we see someone walking down with a cigarette. So you can't just assume that because you asked maybe someone near you that who couldn't smell it, uh, you can't be the judge, obviously, because you're wearing a perfume, you're going to smell it. But you can't assume that others won't smell it either. I say that's a very tricky thing. You have to be very careful. I would say avoid wearing perfume. What we know for sure is a deodorant for the most part or like something on your body under the clothes, whatever you spray your body with under the clothes, it is very unlikely unless you spray your hand that it will go out of your clothing, especially when you're wearing layers. But spraying the clothes, it's technically impossible to claim that you can walk by and people will not smell it. Uh, uh, that, no, I, I don't think so. And I think Abu Sab, this is one, I think this is the last question. Hopefully uh, we can take uh, this question is, Going back to the etiquettes of parents and children, my parents compare me to many other kids. I think this is something most of us have gone through at some point of time. I personally don't like it and it feels very suffocating. Should I let them know or should I keep silent? Keep silent, Habibi. Keep silent. They're comparing you to someone else that they believe is doing good. They want you to be as good or better. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Look, man. Look, parents are never going to be perfect. You're not going to have this, the parent that has everything right. And so they're older than you. It's a different generation. They have a different uh, set of criteria. Just try to be a flexible child. Try to be, uh, try to have an open mind. They want to compare you to someone else. Uh, you know, look at what that person has and try to acquire those skills. Uh, why do we always, I know that you feel offended, but if you really want to capitalize on it, Say, okay, what, what does he have that they are, why, what for? Let me, let me, let me bring on this set of skills. Let me become better than this person and make it means for you to push yourself and encourage yourself to be better. SubhanAllah, it's a win-win situation. Why not? Zakullah khair. I think uh, Abu Sab, uh, we have still have questions, but uh, I think uh, we need to stick to the time. And uh, we still have some more questions and I'm sure I'm just looking at the live feed. We have the questions. Maybe, maybe we will not guarantee anything, but maybe we can do something in the future, in the coming future where maybe we can get this answered or Abu Musab, you can maybe answer this separately. But uh, we would like to, uh, uh, you know, ask for, uh, you know, uh, we are sorry that we cannot answer all these questions because clearly the questions which came in in the past three weeks, we had to prioritize them. And many questions which came were off topic as well. That is the reason that we're not answered. And uh, inshallah, we hope, uh, you know, the session. Yeah, uh, Shia, allow me to interrupt. Look, if the people have questions, uh, I think we can push it a little bit longer. Just because we don't want to, we don't want them to feel uh, that they haven't been at, uh, catered for. So we can, we can afford, a, we can afford a little bit more time, inshallah. Uh, because obviously, obviously, since it's not a lecture, whoever's done, uh, basically, yes. can, uh, nobody has the pressure to stay. It's live. If you're done, you can you know, go eat your dinner. And if you would like to stay with us, then we're always happy to have you. So it's, it's your call. We can continue, inshallah. Definitely. If that is the case, I think there are two to three questions I would definitely like to uh, be addressed. Okay. Uh, a question is, uh, my mother wears a uh, wrong hijab sometimes uh, not very appropriate and uh, she asked me asked me to go out with her should i accompany her if she wants to go nearby wouldn't this be facilitating in sin i have told her this many times um no no because uh if you if if she i believe she's going to go out anyways uh, do i understand i don't know if if you mean uh, let me just give you both scenarios so that i can ask you a follow up question uh, either if you don't go out with her, she will not go at all. And if you have the ability to do so, then and without you know creating a conflict, then that's good news. Be, uh, but if this is not the case, if she's going to go out anyways, then you really didn't gain anything by not joining her. Rather, I would say you want to be on good terms with your mom. You want to be the good daughter. 
to your mom or son, I don't know which one you are, and you want to use those as means to advise your mother. At the end of the day, the good relationship between the parents allows them to communicate at a mature level where the parents will actually make changes and amendments to their behavior depending on how much their children care for them. So you want to weigh the benefits and the harms. It's, it could be yes, it could be no. It really depends on what will be the outcome of your decision. If it's going to create a bigger fitna and your mother is going to be upset with you and scream at you and have a big fitna at home, then that defeats the purpose. Now you're, you're avoiding one evil, but you're creating a bigger evil. You understand? If doing so will, will minimize the evil and you're forced to, you know the maslaha, irtikab aqal al-mafsadatayn. We have a principle in, in Islam where you have to commit the lesser of two evils. So going out with her is one evil and, uh, and then not going out with her is going to create a bigger evil. You actually are allowed to commit the lesser of two evils to minimize the level of evil. You get what I'm saying? Yay. Next. Uh, next question is, uh, if a husband doesn't give the wife her rights and the wife can't do anything regard it, regarding it, but she don't want her husband to get sin from Allah, what could be done? She doesn't want her husband to get the sin from Allah, but he doesn't, what is he? He doesn't fulfill her rights? Yes. Like, and she can't do anything about it. So basically she's saying the husband does not fulfill her rights and she can't do anything about it. Maybe she can't address it. But she, at the same time, because she can't do anything about it, she does not want the husband to get uh, the sin from Allah. You know, get, you know, uh, sin for this. That's what wishful. Th that's wishful thinking. I mean, what you want or what you don't want, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make a difference because it's it's between him and Allah. If he's not fulfilling your right and it's an obligation on him to fulfill your right, whether you are okay or not okay with it, or whether you want him or not want him to be sinful then he's still going to be sinful. What you can do is make dua for him uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't, you know, doesn't hold him accountable for his shortcomings, but he still needs to fix this problem. Okay, and I think I'm just going through... Okay, uh, is there any sign in this world that indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a person and is pleased with him? Yes. Yes, there are signs and uh, I've given a lecture about this. I'm trying to remember the title. I hope I will remember the title. Uh, SubhanAllah. Anyways, the, the hadith of uh, Jibreel, uh, the hadith that, that, that when Allah Azza wa loves the servant, he calls on to Jibreel and he tells him that I love this person. And then Jibreel will call on the malaika. He will say Allah loves this person, so love him. Then the angels will love him. Then Allah will put love and acceptance for, for him on earth. And the hadith continues to mention the same if Allah hates a person. So yes, one of the signs that Allah Azza wa Jal loves a person is that Allah Azza wa Jal puts acceptance in the hearts of the believers, the righteous believers uh, towards that person. Not that he has a mass following of, of you know, uh, fans uh, who are corrupt. So in terms of among the believers, that person will have acceptance among the people. Also the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal facilitates that person will see in his life that Allah Azza wa Jal answers his dua. That Allah Azza wa Jal facilitates his affair. Whenever he is in trouble and he begs on Allah, Allah gets him out of it. Yani these are things that the person will sense. That Allah gives him understanding of the religion. And, and so on and so on. Uh, that his parents are pleased with him. There are many signs that suggest that Allah Azza wa Jal loves a person. We cannot say uh, for sure about anyone, but these are signs. The lecture is titled, Allah calls on Jibreel. Please watch this lecture on YouTube. Allah calls on Jibreel, add my name, Mujdi Akari or Abu Mus'ab at the end. And the lecture is a complete answer to your question, inshallah. We also have a question uh, from Etiquette with Allah. Salam, please explain the issue of purity and impurity of clothes related to acts of worship like Salah. I think it's a very uh, detailed question actually. Yeah. Uh, I think there's another occasion for this one because it's a lot of fiqh issues and uh, it's just I, I think that question will, will consume a lot of time and it has another occasion for, for discussing inshallah. Forgive me, uh, questioner, maybe you can you know, contact me uh, uh, on uh, privately and whatever specific question you have, inshallah, I'll try my best to answer it. Barakallah feek. Mm.
that content is suitable, understandable. You said and some of the things are available. Please, I'm just going through some of the questions which you see, which are on topic, and some of them we are already uh, answered. So, Rafa, in case we completely disagree with parents, how to handle the situation? Answered. Answered. Smells bad. Okay. Okay. I think we have. Uh, we have a question which it's a follow up question to one of the answers a father is blaming a child but in reality it's due to the non understanding of the matter from father what's the limitation when dealing with parents in such cases you've already answered this yes we have and somebody has asked me to uh, let uh, abu musab do more of the talking and answering and me to less what the somebody's asked uh, abu musab let abu musab do more of the answering and talking and uh, i do less of that inshallah hey, okay. hey hey get off my shef man <laughs> no actually it's true we are short on time hey, no uh, problem and uh, parents parents wants okay how do you consider kids more than okay that's already done i think uh, share again we are uh, 15 minutes are over again if there is some, more of these questions we will filter through and inshallah let's see uh, maybe i must have could do a different session or no co commitments but we will see inshallah what is the best way forward no so, problem so inshallah jazakumullah khairan uh, to all the brothers and sisters who have actually been very engaged with us uh, throughout this uh, series from the first week of ramadan till you know this is the last week and hopefully this is the last session uh, and yeah this is the last session and we really hope you know uh, you guys have benefited and also we would like to thank uh, our sheikh our ustad uh, abu musab for for the amazing and excellent uh, you know answers and how he actually covered some of the topics and definitely there is a lot of content uh, on his channels as well and uh, other than that uh, if people who have not seen now some of you might have been logged in for the first time definitely go to the kalima youtube channel and make sure to actually see all the seven previous sessions okay most of the questions were actually collected from these past sessions so inshallah uh, with that uh, we will actually wrap up this session and uh, we ask allah to accept our uh, you know everything inshallah so uh, that's all abu musab anything else last uh, words you want to add nope jazakumullah khair all for for tuning in and for uh, engaging us uh, at this level and uh, I, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make this deed uh, something that we uh, see the fruits of on Yawm Al Qiyamah uh, when nothing else will really matter I want to thank Kalima uh, one of my uh, one of my most dear and beloved uh, organizations to me ever since I started the uh, da'wah many years ago Alhamdulillah that we still uh, collaborate up until this day uh, it's, a, it's a place to be uh, visited, it's a place to be collaborated with, it's a place for you to learn the deen uh, in your own language. So, Zakum Allah Khair and Barakallah Fikum, Subhanakallah and Bihamdik, Shadu Allah Ilaha Illa Ant, Astaghfiruka Atubu Alaykum. Assalamu Alaikum. Alaykum Salaam Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.